I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sinan Aral. His research is at the cutting edge of the digital economy, and today he will give his perspective on the debate between big data and digital experimentation as tools of the new trade, using information to influence change. I'd like everyone uh, in our audience to know that uh, actually this is uh, probably Sinan's first public appearance after being named a full tenured professor at the Sloan School, so I hope you should all congratulate him for that. I've had the pleasure of knowing Sinan since he was a lowly PhD student. So even though he now far outranks me at MIT Sloan, I have enough dirt on him to curry favor. Please welcome Professor Sinan Aral. Those of you who come to this annually will vividly remember that last year I talked about experimentation, uh, how to do experimentation, and, spe and specifically how to do experimentation in networks. And then a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said, Sinan, you know, that was really fascinating. I thought, you know, your statistics were great, all the ideas were great, and so on. But, uh, you know, experimentation isn't easy. I can't get my boss to sign off on it. I can't get my technical people to, to figure it out. Uh, it costs us a lot of money. I'm not really sure if it's worth it to us. You know, you, do you have some sort of alternatives, ways that we could get at some of this stuff without doing experimentation? Uh, and that's how we arrived at the topic of this talk today. So uh, as a recap of last year, I'll give you uh, one slide, which is that uh, we've just recently published a lengthy chapter in the new uh, Oxford Handbook of the Economics of Networks called Networked Experimentation, uh, which goes into all the details about how you would design a networked experiment, all the statistical inference challenges, and all of the how-tos, the one, two, threes of uh, blocking and tackling of doing experiments in a network. And when I say in a network, I mean that you know over the past 10 years, we've worked on uh, experiments all over the types of large-scale platforms that Marshall and his colleagues were just talking about on platforms like Facebook and, and uh, Yahoo and other types of platforms like this. So if you're interested in that, uh, you won't see any of it today, but I highly recommend uh, taking a look at that chapter. So, the impetus for today's uh, comments is, is really, how do we substitute for experiments when we really can't experiment? Um, can we use large amounts of data to get at the causal types of estimates that we would want to get by doing an experiment uh, just by uh, being clever with large amounts of observational data? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to describe two instances in which we've done that. Uh, just to give you a sense for how it can be done and how you have to sort of use your creativity to get the job done, in a sense. And then briefly talk about when it's appropriate to do one or the other, okay? So the first example I'd like to, to give you is uh, our collaboration with a large global fitness tracking company uh, where they wanted to sort of analyze whether exercise behavior between uh, their consumers was contagious, whether if they could convince some of their uh, consumers to run more often, would it encourage their friends to run more often? And you can imagine why this would be valuable to them, primarily because the, this creates engagement in the platform and delivers some of the network externality-based uh, defense mechanisms that Marshall was talking about in terms of the network effects. Uh, but it also encourages the peer-to-peer -peer transmission of the demand for their products and services. If you yourself as a viable customer are really happy with the product and are using it, and that influences your friends to be more excited about the product, then you can imagine that there are social spillovers in the demand for those types of products. And they said, but Sinan, you know, we're not going to be able to experiment in this case. Uh, because we have uh, a lot of data, but we can't really randomly assign our consumers to run or not run. I guess we could go door to door with a cattle prod at 6 a.m. and try to get them out of bed and get them running, but uh, for some reason they weren't willing to do that. So they said, can we think of some other ways uh, to get at this problem? And so we thought about it for a while, and we decided that there are a few things that we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to really have robust measurement of exercise behavior. We wanted to have almost as good or gold standard style causal inference as you would get in an experiment, and we wanted it to be generalizable. So what we did was uh, we partnered with this fitness tracking company uh, that had lots of people using different devices to track their running activity. 
Uh, and we wanted to collect data that was representative of the <clears throat> global running population. So we collected global running data from over five years, which was nearly 14 million people uh, running with about half a billion running activity events over those five years. So this is truly a large-scale data set of global running activity. And there you see the diurnal patterns of running. You can see that people run on the weekend more than they do on the weekday, that when we're sleeping, we're not running, although some of us are. You can see that uh, you know, at, at, uh, at lunch and at dinner, you know, after dinner, there's a, there's a bit of a spike, and so on and so forth, just to give you a sense for how people run uh, around the world. And we added to that all of that fitness data uh, the global social network that connected these people through the platform of the fitness company. So on this company, you can, on this platform, you can uh, join the website, uh, you can upload all of your data, and you can make friends, and when you upload a run, it shares the fact that you ran with your friends, and, th and that's visible to them. So this is what forms the social network of consumers. So we knew who runs, how, how they run, when, where, and how fast they run, and who their friends were for a global network of runners. And this is a snapshot of the, the running network there. And uh, what we needed to do is we needed to say, well, since we don't have that cattle prod to randomly assign some people to run and other people not to run, what could we use that is analogous to a cattle prod randomly assigned to users that was highly correlated with whether or not you would run, but on any given day was not correlated with the running activity of your friends? And that took us about two and a half years to come up with the answer to that question. <laughs> Once you have an answer to that question, the rest of the, the, rest of the solution is easy. It's just some fancy statistics. Um, and the answer to that question is the weather. What is, a, what is a random cattle prod that is correlated with whether you run or not and is uncorrelated with the running patterns of your friends, and that's the weather. So here's a, a graph of running and precipitation in New York City. That's precipitation in blue and running in green. And you see every time there's a big spike in precipitation in blue, you see subsequent drops in running behavior in green, meaning that when it's really rainy, a very sizable portion of the population that would run doesn't run. Okay? And this is also true for the temperature. So on the left-hand side there, you see running against per capita, uh, running uh, per capita running behavior on the y-axis against precipitation on the x-axis. So the more it, it rains, the less people run, okay? relatively monotonically decreasing. And then on the right-hand side, you see temperature. So there, it's, not, it's sort of non-monotonic. It's got this inverted U-shaped relationship. People like to run when it's not too cold and not too hot. Okay, so they run right at the Goldilocks principle of right when it's a nice day. Not too, if it's 95 degrees, you're not going to run. If it's 35 degrees, you're also not going to run. Fahrenheit, that is. Um, and so we use these two pieces of data as the random cattle prod that would have been an experiment. So let me describe how we did that. We collected data from about 40,000 weather stations across nearly 40 countries in which we have running data. And this is a map of all the weather stations uh, in the United States, which is about 2,700. And the density of these weather stations really correlates well to the uh, population density. So we have good coverage of running or runners as well as uh, their weather that they experience. And what we essentially want to do in this case to mimic this experiment that we would want to run with the cattle prod is we want to say, we want to identify people who, have un who experience uncorrelated weather. Okay, so if I live in New York City, and my friend lives in Phoenix, Arizona, if it's raining in New York City, it's highly unlikely that it will, in a correlated way, be raining in, in Phoenix as well. So what we want to do is we want to take these people that are friends but are separated by geography, and we essentially want to use the exogenous variation in your friend's weather as an instrumental variable, they call it, uh, for your running activity, and what we're trying to do is really ask, in a tongue-in-cheek way, does a rainy day in New York reduce running behavior in Arizona? Because if it does, it can only be through social influence. Notice the sort of creativity that is involved in using big data to get at experimental results without the ability to run an experiment. You sort of have to think outside of the box uh, to, really, to really accomplish some of these things. Okay? So, when we do this, what do we find? Well, we find 
very strong and robust peer effects across many different types of activity measure that decay over time. So in the top left corner, this is the social multiplier or peer effect of your running behavior on your friend's running behavior and the distance run. So if you run an extra kilometer today, your friends will run an extra four tenths of a kilometer today. Tomorrow, they'll also run more, but not as, much as the, not as much more as they would run today. And two days from now, they'll also run more, but not as much more as they would run today. Same is true for the pace at which they run. If you run faster, they will run faster. And that's a causal relationship. How long you run, and also how many calories you burn as well. So that's sort of the major result. Then we wanted to see how these causal effects vary over different friendship relationships. So take, for example, the friend who is a couch potato and, and their friend who is a marathon runner. Okay, so call these the marathon running friends and the couch potato friends. So with a quick show of hands, let me, let me see in the audience, those of you who believe that the couch potatoes will influence the marathon runners rather than the marathon runners influencing the couch potatoes, raise your hand. So couch potatoes influencing marathon runners. OK? Put your hands down. And then marathon runners influencing couch potatoes. Many, many more people. So most of the people in this room think that if a marathon runner runs a kilometer more, their couch potato friends will be more influenced than the other way around. Turns out that the people who voted first are more correct. Congratulations. So when a couch potato like myself decides to get out the door and run, it shocks the marathon runner into action, is the basic story. <laughs> They're like, oh my god, Sinan's running today. What's wrong with the world? I better get out there and do my miles. Now, if my marathon running buddy decides to run like the 27th kilometer, that's not going to really be a blip on my radar screen is the sort of result that we've found here. What do you think? Um, well, actually, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the next result uh, for the interest of time. So that's one example. Another example is uh, some research that we're doing with the New York Times, which we haven't sort of released yet. And I spent a year with the, with the New York Times and their R&D lab to try and understand how we could think about uh, their relationship to the digital economy. And we focused on a project that did two things. The first thing it did was it collected all the tweets, retweets, and clicks on any shortened URL that points back to the New York Times, as well as all the clickstream data on the Times that will tell us uh, browsing behavior of those people who are referred through social media. In that kind of project, we are trying to understand how word of mouth uh, conversation about New York Times content drives readership of the Times and what that means to monetization. And the second part of the project was really about understanding rigorously how the design of a paywall can affect readership, subscription rates, revenues, and profitability. So what I'm going to talk about today is, for the last three minutes, is the latter, the second piece about the design of the, the paywall. And I will say that uh, my collaborator in this project, Paramvir Dillon, is sitting uh, in the audience there. If you could raise your hand, Paramvir. He's, uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna talk more about this project, Paramvir is, uh, is an excellent source to talk to. So basically, there's a lot of different ways that you can design a paywall. Uh, and those of you in the content uh, or publishing industries will know this very well. You can think about all or, nothing, all or nothing type designs, like the Wall Street Journal, where if you're a subscriber, you have full access. And if you're a non-subscriber, you get nothing. Uh, or exclusive content, like ESPN puts some pieces of exclusive content behind a paywall, but not others, or a metered system like the New York Times, 10 articles a month, or a leaky system where you can have 10 articles a month, but if you're referred by social media or you do a, a Google search, you get in for free and it doesn't count against your meter. These are all different elements of the design space. So here's a little map. Here you have a quantity. As you go to the right, more of the quantity. Uh, you have more num a higher number of free articles, a lower number of free articles, and here's another one, which is diversity. Do you get access to all the content or some subset of the content, like only certain sections of the paper? And you can imagine a design, the design of your paywall being anywhere in this space. And our question was, well, how does the actual place that you put your design matter for readership, cross-channel demand elasticities, and so on? So we collected a bunch of data over 2.5 billion page views by 525 million unique visitors to the Times over a period of time. And we needed to, again, search for mimics of a randomized experiment. 
So similar to the cattle prod of the rain and the runners, we wanted to find something that would change readership behavior, but that was not correlated with the reader's own preferences. And so what we found were two changes to the New York Times paywall, as well as to the design of the New York Times mobile app. And with this, we were able to estimate cross-channel demand elasticities. So the mobile application paywall went from being able to uh, have access to all the content to only being able to access three articles on the app per day without a meter uh, on uh, June 27, 2013. And it actually went through two different stages. First, you were only able to access two sections, and then you were able to access all the sections. And at first, uh, you were able to access um, uh, as many articles as you want, and then later only three articles per day. And we use these changes to identify how readership on the mobile application was either complementary or cannibalizing readership on the actual browser uh, content, and vice versa. And here's what we found. What we found for app demand was that browser demand is a complement. The more people browse on the website, the more they will browse, they will, that will cause them to browse on the app. And the more diversity that you give them on the application, the more content they will consume on the application itself. But browser diversity is a substitute for application content demand. So the more access you give them on the browser, the less they will read on the application. Let me give you one more result, which is that when you look at the browser demand, the application demand is a almost zero effect but a weak substitute. Uh, but the browser diversity is a major complement. So the more uh, access to different sections you give them, the more they will demand. The more you prod them to use the app, it has a slightly but very small substitutive effect with the demand for the browser. And what they can do with these types of results is think about how to monetize this multi-device platform by changing paywall settings and by, uh, by measuring what that does to cross-channel demand. Now, I promised uh, one final conclusion is, when do you do what? Experiments are really robust, but are very narrow and difficult to implement. So if you have a big digital platform where you can easily change things, A-B testing and multivariate testing is very easy. If you have a product that isn't quite as digital, or you have a product where it's not really legitimate to randomly assign different paywalls, for example, to different users, uh, then you have a problem with your ability to experiment, and you have to go to this big data solution. And these are some examples of ways that we can do that. Thank you very much.